Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, of track three uh, is on data ecosystem and platforms. Uh, ben Choi, I'm an assistant professor at Nanyang Business School, and I'm also your track chair for this morning. Uh, please feel free to get the QR code, which will be coming up shortly for the Q&A. Uh, and if you shall uh, prefer to actually ask us in person, probably we can do that as well. So at the end of uh, the talk, we have time for Q&A. Today, uh, we are very delighted to introduce Associate Professor Hannah um, to give us a talk on staying on the right side of law in AL value creation, IP thread to board dues and regulatory landscape. Hannah, please. Okay, good morning, everybody, and uh, it's good to see you here, and I want to thank the uh, organizers for having me here today. Uh, let's see if this thing works. Okay, good. Um, basically, uh, my talk is a switch from what you've probably been hearing yesterday and today, in that I'm within a serious, very serious business, and my my is actually double degrees in computer science and law um, from the University of Sydney, where I come from. And I would say that in terms of being a computer scientist, it gives me the technical knowledge not to be enamored by extravagant claims by technologists of saying they, you know, a system can do B, C, D, F, G, when actually it's doing A, B, C, D, F, G quite badly and they do B very well. And as a lawyer, I am risk adverse. So my whole, I would say my whole approach to any problem is let's minimize and get rid of the risk. And that's the bottom line. So to hear from me today is going to be a, a more balanced perspective. Um, I've been working in data protection or uh, space for nearly 30 years now. And just, I was back in Australia. And as you can see here, I've got a couple of books, my recent books, I've got six books. These are the two, two recent ones. So in terms of data protection, the book you see on the left is really a comparative approach between the Singapore PPA and the GDPR. Um, this was published, I mean, it's a bit out of date now, it was published in 2017. Uh, and then I've been working in terms of the AI law space for the last about eight to 10 years now. My book on autonomous vehicles, uh, in case you're not aware, autonomous vehicles actually use a lot of AI. It's, it's funny because I speak to a lot of people uh, over the years and they say, oh, you're in AI. And I say, yeah, autonomous vehicles use AI. I have no idea. So that's my my, my two most recent books. Uh, really, my research areas are anything to do with edge technology and law, and regulation and policy. I think what I, I really want to start off with is the, to push the fact that AI is well, AI systems are great servants, but they're very dangerous masters. So if you rely on them as being our masters, you're going to fall down and fall down very badly. So what I'm trying to do in my talk is just to see how we can harness the benefits of AI, but without exposing ourselves to undue liability and risk. Today, what I'll do is simply cover a few very simple questions that haven't been really addressed in this um, conference uh, tracks yet, and then just try to answer these questions in a very helicopter view. Um, and then hopefully that you can land safely after using AI, a gentle landing and not a big fat crash. So as you can probably tell, I'm not here to tell you about all the wonderful outputs that you can obtain from AI because that's not how it's work and that's not how computer scientists work. We are keen to dissect and go down and to start from the beginning. So we don't just focus on grandiose processes that are half-truths. So at the most basic level, we always need to come back to, and, and this is coming from a computer scientist and a lawyer, as an AI tool work. And essentially, if I can put it very simply, just simply search, copy, and paste, and repeat. But it does this in a somewhat more intelligent way than just search, copy, paste, and repeat. We all can do search, copy, paste, and repeat. 
Um, one, one enormous benefit of machines like AI and, and, and algorithms like AI is they can do this at very, very high speed. So because it's doing things like high speed, like an autonomous vehicle, you think that there's some kind of intelligence. And I can tell you that even for generative AI or predictive AI like autonomous vehicles, a lot of it is just copy and pasting. And really, it does not really answer um, the questions that I want to look at today, which is concerning IP, intellectual property. Um, I mean, I chose this topic because I looked at the program and there, there was, I mean, actually data management is actually one of my key areas of research and I have quite a number of grants in data management, uh, but I haven't seen IP be covered that much in the conference in, uh, you say in today. So I thought I, I, I'd just talk a little bit about IP. So simple question, can AI create or co-create IP? And let's tackle this first with copyright. Um, it's, and the answer if for all of those is, is yes. No. I think you probably hear this a lot. If you, if you, if you talk to lawyers, they'll always tell you it depends. And it's not because we want to earn money for you because I'm not a, you know, I don't practice that much anyway. So I don't have those huge hourly rates. But really the answer is yes and no, because it depends. As you will probably know, the subject matter of copyright are quite varied and it includes things like literary works, musical works, songs, dramatic works, videos, um, motion pictures, audio, audio work, sound recordings, architectural works, and it goes on. And, and the answer to this question in terms of copyright is, well, there's a big problem because in many countries, uh, is actually given works that are created by human beings. So it's actually to reward the human beings for their creative effort. So in many countries, including Singapore, Australia, there's no copyright protection for works generated solely by a machine or AI algorithm. So, um, but, but of course, if you, if you can um, show that you've got this algorithm that produced something that looks like copyright, and then if you can prove that there was substantial human input by you, yes, you can get some copyright protection but you have to show that there was. So that is the first problem. That if you have an AI tool and it's completely uh, created something solely by itself, you can't, you can't keep copyright protection. And the second reason um, why it is a both yes and a no is this requirement of originality. So for anything to be copyright, it has to be original. So we need to look very closely at what is actually produced uh, because if what is created, is not original, it cannot, um, it cannot attract any copyright uh, protection. So just to give you an example, as most of us uh, are consumers of music, uh, Universal Music Group, um, they, they actually own about one third of all the music in the world. Um, they actually recently told streaming platforms like Apple or Spotify to block AI services from scraping melodies and lyrics from the copyrighted songs. And the simple reason for this is because AI bots are actually used to script uh, these songs and then the AI bots then uh, feed the, the data. I mean, I'm just going to call it data because ultimately songs, lyrics, music, it's all bits, one, one zeros. And one to zero is data. So it's to prevent these AI bots from scraping all these ones and zeros in terms of music and using these songs to train their AI uh, of so churn music that sounds like popular artists. So, so I'm, I'm, okay, this is showing my vintage here. Uh, I grew up on ABBA, so I love ABBA. But if you, if you have AI ball that, uh, or AI program that can churn out music that sounds like ABBA, you're not going to buy your ABBA thing. You just listen to this fake ABBA. So that, that is what Universal Music Group is concerned about because if they own 30% of the market share, um, they would be on third, I think. They, they would be very concerned because that's, uh, their revenue and income down the drain. And similarly, uh, on a similar vein, you've got Google. Google actually um, experimented with this thing called Music LM, and it can actually generate music from text descriptions. So if you want to say, I want, um, I want Mozart or something, it can actually generate. But the problem was, after it was trained on like 280,000 hours of music, Google has not released the tool. Why? because its own research has found that there was potential misappropriation of the creative content because they found 1% of the music generated by this music LM was a direct replica of the copyright work. So 
it's a direct replica of the code, right? That there's a problem there already because it's not original. And similarly, because I mean, every, I mean, I was in Paris last week with a, a delegation from Singapore. Everybody was talking about ChatGPT. Um, and similarly, yesterday we heard ChatGPT a lot. But I say, and I think one of the speakers actually had a poem that ChatGPT had produced. Well, all I can say is I haven't input that poem, the words of that poem into Google, but I'm quite sure that if I input the words of that, that he showed on Google, Google will probably say, okay, this line from this, this, this. As university professors, we use a tool called Turnitin, which detect plagiarism. So I'm sure if I put that into Turnitin, it will probably be able to tell me exactly where uh, chat GPT got it from. And really, if, if it's regurgitated, more or less word for word, but it doesn't have to be word for word, it is already out there, it's not original, and not only is it not original, it's actually plagiarism. Uh, so so the, 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 there are problems with just simply just taking a chat GPT and just using it out of the box. Um, so I just, I just want to caution that, you know, in terms of these kinds of tools, it's, it's great to have, but be careful. And even if you're talking about copyrighted materials that's out of copyright, so for example, um, I mean, many of you probably know that copyright doesn't last forever and it was extended from 50 years to 70 years because of Mickey Mouse, um, because they wanted to extend the protection from Mickey Mouse. And so this is not for a time frame. It's about 70 years after the death of the author, depending on which jurisdiction type of materials. And so even if you have something that's gone out of copyright and you try to feed that in as your input data for your AI algorithm, that is not going to produce a vision either because the core simply use the test and say well it's it's an original because it's it's all based on you know, Mozart or Beethoven or whatever and say well it's not original full stop and if you pass the threshold requirement of originality there's copyright end of story um and and I have to say that there was a, a real test in 2016 because the AI system could actually compose uh, book music polyphonic sounds of course but it was in the style of uh, Bach and Sebastian Bach but but it matters Bach is dead and if the materials out of copyrights public domain we asked for the same problem that it's not original because it's in the style of Bach and it's original so we on to this big uh, regime IP which is trademarks these these are uh, trademarks. I, I think we all know trademarks. I mean, I've got a trademark there at the bottom left corner, the NTU trademark. I mean, that is a trademark. Trademarks are just simply signs that are used by entities and businesses to associate themselves with a particular product or service. Obviously, university NTU is an educational service. And so it's really to distinguish the goods and services of one entity from those other. Being a sign or a logo, as you can see, is a form of artistic work. You would register most of, in most countries that I register that to your trademark because that's easier protection. But there's also common law trademark as well. But the thing is, if you try to use an AI program to churn out a, a trademark or a sign for you, um, it looks just like somebody else's trademark or someone else's artistic work, then it will not attract protection under trademark law because there'll be opposition based on copyright issues or substantial similarity issues under trademark law. So, Basically, trademarks is a no as well for the answer. And moving on, which is probably the trickiest of, um, out of three, uh, the patent is is very complex. It's a very complex field. For a patent to be granted, what is essential is an inventive step. Now, what this test really is about is that the scope of the invention um, must actually not be obvious to a person skilled in the art. So that's the inventiveness aspect of it. So it's got to be an inventive step. And this approach of making sure that it's not uh, something that is obvious to a person who's skilled in a prior art means that the person needs to look at the entire prior art, which means that it's a data intensive process. And the problem with this, and this has not really been sorted out in the courts or the patent systems around the world, is that some may not be obvious to a human being because we as humans are not capable of ingesting and digesting so much information and data all ago. But yet, 
an system machine, it can achieve this connection spotting, I call it, uh, so easily that what is not obvious to a human being, it may be algorithmically very obvious to an AI program. And so this is really quite a tricky process, and it depends on invention at stake and how different it is from human, for human inventors known can do. Um, so, but as I said, that it, it's really an issue which has not yet been sorted out by the courts or, or the patent systems around the world. Uh, so, rather, in, it just leaves you a fuzzy answer because you know, the answer to these three major IP regions is that it's a uh, click yes or no, but it depends, and much will depend on what the courts decide, and it will also depend on the actual items and the jurisdictions as well. So they, these are the more difficult um, questions in terms of the difficult regimes. I mean, I've only covered the three major ones because these are the most front-facing publicly, um, uh, yeah, facing public facing available IP protection. There are other areas of IP protection that are more secret, like confidential information or in other jurisdictions, it's called trade secrets. And they are even more complex because there there's no unified international um, treaties that involve, that are involved. So these are the main ones. But for the next question I want to um, tackle is can AI infringe IP rights? And again, I'm gonna look at these three and hopefully um, the answer is much clearer and it is yes. Obviously I can infringe IP rights and that is exactly why, why I'm here to give um, because if actually use something that's been designed and programmed by an AI algorithm, you really need to be sure that it doesn't infringe on something's major um, IP protection. Because if it does, you can get sued and you can get sued and have to pay a lot of damages. And, and I mean, just to give you, I mean, uh, this depends on the AI program itself, how it's designed and how it's programmed and what kind of data has been fed to the AI algorithm. And the simplest illustration I can give is probably a generative AI program like ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT, in case some of you have been experimenting, it actually uses reinforcement learning uh, from human feedback. What this means is that there's this constant human interaction as it improves itself. And the initial model, the original one of ChatGPT was trained using supervised Tune, uh, human feedback, meaning that human AI trainers provided conversations to, um, to AI algorithm in which they decide. User and the AI assistant. And so these trainers, original trainers were given model written suggestions to help them compose the responses as well. Now we don't know where or what these responses were. And if these original model written suggestions for the AI algorithm for the chat GPT can copyright protected works like plays and dialogues, there are serious questions raised about the copyright ownership of the output from chat GPT. Uh, so that it may end up being like Google's Music LM where the app could just well be all copy and paste and just don't know from where it copied the materials because then we have to go search and find from where and if you have access to I mean, it was relatively not bad, I would say, in terms of picking up copyrighted materials because uh, it does have a large tech bank to compare it with. But I would say still that something like the universities, uh, what universities pay for and turn it in, um, that is a wire bank because it is constantly being updated. Um, so, I mean, I say ChatGPT gives you a really beautiful poem or song. Don't don't be over the moon about it because um, I, it, I probably cannot use it because it's somebody else's copyrighted work. And if you use it, you'd be liable for copyright infringement um, because you'll be sued by the original copyright holder. So this is really just saying to you that all well, businesses can use AI to create in case of use at your own risk because there's a danger that what you think you're using was created by an AI program, but in actual fact, it was actually just copied and stolen from somewhere else. So I've only just copied, I've just covered 
intellectual property today um, and, and AI, but there are actually many other AI legal issues that need to be considered. So it's good to leverage on AI. We need to be careful of how we leverage it and whether it's a public facing activity like you know, a trademark or, or a pattern or more secretively used as a trade secret. So what I want to do now is because I think that for all of us, we, we, we need to be careful, but I would like to turn out um, attention to practice uh, duties and sweet duties because these have uh, recently come into the limelight in March this year. So it's like less than two months ago. The Institute of Directors, uh, which is actually a large organization um, that that uh, is it's a professional organization for company directors and senior business leaders. The Institute of Directors they actually came out with a list of uh, checklists. Uh, and the checklist is not yet, but I can tell you that very soon it will be complied by the courts if, if a matter ever goes to court. So this checklist, it provides um, boards with high-level understanding, uh, it provides a checklist for boards to see if they have high-level understanding of where their organisations stand when it comes to a course of AI. And this is particularly um, of relevance if something goes wrong. Um, and, and because of this checklist, that was uh, issued, it really starts the beginning of the requirement of accountability of board members and C-suite officers because their board level, really, the board level, they really must understand the opportunities and risks of AI. It is absolutely essential. And, and because the companies and the board members, they are to specific legal duties, this actually requires them to understand what AI has been used in a company, how it's used, and what the risks are. Now, there's time today to go through all of these checklist points, but readily available on the website of the Institute of Directors. So you can have a look at them if you want. But I'll just highlight a few important ones. Um, so for example, it says you, you basically need to continually or measure what AI is in use and what you're doing in your company. And as I said, you know, I have not I don't have time to cover confidential information, but I have read earlier this month that Samsung had banned the use of ChatGPT after it discovered that its employees were putting sensitive code ChatGPT. I mean, I mean, I don't know what they teach them in computer science schools anymore, but we had to through and debug our code by ourselves uh, using the good old method. But you have you see these people at Samsung taking shortcuts and just uploading sensitive code. And so Samsung said, well, this is this is trade secrets, confidential information from the company, so banned it. So this is where the boards need to be very careful and understand what is being used and drill down to the, the employees. Uh, the second checklist that I would like to uh, raise for attention is to undertake impact assessments um, and consider the wider stakeholder community. So what they suggest is, and this is really coming from law, a lot of the legal case laws over the years. So basically, the assessment must be undertaken, which consider possible negative effects on a range of stakeholders, such as employees, customers, suppliers, partners, and shareholders. Uh, thirdly, there has to be accountability. Uh, the board has to be accountable both legally and ethically for the positive use of AI within an organization, including if you include a party product which emits AI. And lastly, as a super, super important and I'm not just saying this because I'm a lawyer because it really is super important. You have to monitor the evolving regulatory environment. Organizations must be aware of existing and prospective legislation affecting AI. And in this regard, I would just like to highlight a couple of jurisdictions um, for you. The first is the EU. Um, EU has been extremely hard for quite a number of years now on trying to regulate AI. Just a few years ago, this, uh, progress on the AI Act when they approved in the EU Parliament, and it may well become the very first uh, regulation on AI. Now, the AI Act is a risk based approach to regulating AI, where the obligations for a system are proportionate to the level of risk that it poses. So this is a um, classification system that determines the, the, the risk of AI technology. and. It is very European centric because, as many of us know, the Europeans are very strong on fundamental rights of a person. So if there's anything that is going to endanger the health and safety of the fundamental rights of the person, they put it in the red basket, meaning that you know it's 
goes on. And so the framework that they have uh, proposed, and, and it's not law yet, but the, the file that's been proposed is actually a f uh, four, four risk tiers. So the risks are unacceptable, high, limited, and minimal. So for limited and minimal risks, uh, you are allowed to use these uh, AI tools with little requirements other than transparency obligations. So some of these tools might be things like spam filters and maybe some advertisement suggestions and so on. Um, they have the unacceptable risk. Now, these unacceptable risks are actually very wide ranging. Then they include things like government social scoring, real time biometric information, identification uh, systems, expenses. Um, and these things, I mean, I'll talk a little bit more about unacceptable risks in a little bit. Um, and then in between these two extremes of uh, limited and minimal and unacceptable, we've got something that's called high risk. And this is the, the ones that I've been focusing on because these systems are limited, but the developers and the users must adhere to regulations that require more rigorous testing and proper documentation and and actually have a of data quality and capability framework that detects the human oversight. So high risk systems, as you can probably guess by now, include things like autonomous vehicles and medical devices and medical infrastructure. And, and I have a couple of projects with RF and CREATE on medical devices um, and, and in a health area. But I just want to touch a little bit more on uh, unacceptable risk applications because I haven't seen the sign go up to tell me to be yet. <laughs> Now, for acceptable risk applications, they're really banned by default and they cannot be deployed in the EU. So, this also is very flat for you because if you do a lot of business in the EU, you may want to take note of this or move your operations and use cases elsewhere. Um, so, they're quite wide ranging because they are really, as I said, they go to the fundamental human rights. So, they include things like AI systems using subliminal techniques or manipulative or deceptive techniques that distort human behavior. So that is completely out. You can't use AI systems that do that. Uh, AI systems that exploit the vulnerabilities of certain individuals or specific groups. So for example, if it's targeting a particular group of people or, or individuals or ethnicity, that's out. Um, Thirdly, biometric categorization systems um, that's based on sensitive attributes or characteristics, that's out. Now for sensitive attributes, it's it models on the, the GDPR, which is based on the predecessor with the Data Protection Directive of 1995. And it includes things like even sexual orientation, trade union, um, uh, association, and so on. Um, what am I up to? Number four, a system uh, for risk assessments to predict criminal and administrative offenses. So basically, it's administration of justice. They are out. You can't use them. I mean, and funny thing, well, not funny, but the interesting thing is that they actually use in other jurisdictions without batting an eyelid. But in the European Union, because of the very strong protection for human rights, they are not allowed. Uh, then there's also a ban on AI systems creating or expanding facial recognition databases through un basically untargeted scraping. So a lot of this is, is basically also back to the data protection of PR in terms of consent. Um, and then lastly, AI systems infer emotions in law enforcement, border management, and the workplace and education. Um, so like, I mean, at least Australia and Singapore, you could probably get away with CCTV camera surveillance of employees, but not in Europe, not in EU. EU. Um, so basically, there's a, there's a lot of requirements. And I just want to touch very briefly because I, my time is nearly up. Just touch very briefly. Okay, because it's really quite the other end of the spectrum. Because uh, again, very recently, like last month, less than a month ago, less than four weeks ago, uh, the UK government published a white paper setting out how it proposed to regulate AI. I would just simply say that it is quite the other end of the spectrum because they are more aligned to Singapore's approach because they drive growth and prosperity and to increase public trust and to strengthen its position as a global leader it is so it's very pro innovation like singapore but it's the proportionate like singapore and it's also looking at things like trustworthiness adaptability and it's got to be collaborative and so what what it's trying to do is that it's trying to make it sectorial in a sense that it will 
have exist regulated. So like, for example, in Singapore, we currently have MAS look after the finance and, and the financial the finance insurance sectors. Um, so what they want to do similar to what we are doing in what we've been doing in Singapore is with sectoral existing regulators will publish your practical guidance and a regulatory framework will cover uh, all sorts of AI, including foundational models like the, the Jet GPT and Google's BART. All of it will be non-statutory, like what we have already in Singapore. And these cross-sectoral principles will uh, also um, yeah, it, the, they're supposed to also ensure some of the things I've already uh, highlighted, like transparency, explainability, fans, and so on. So in, in terms of all of this, I think I, my takeaway is really is just, you know, it's great to use AI, but be careful. And check also, the how shall I say, check also the integrity of it, because if if, if something goes really, really horribly wrong, there is a serious reputational damage. And it can also lead to project delays and loss of valuable corporate information. And all of this will actually end up costing far more in the long run. So I thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, um, actually, my question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, more from a practical point of view, because um, can you comment a little bit on like uh, geopolitically how? this might potentially play out because like perhaps now I'd rather write one set of code to deal with the problem versus each jurisdiction deal with itself. Uh, yeah, I think ultimately you have to decide which market you want to go for because traditionally even when uh, the the EU data protection directive came in in 1995, a lot of businesses moved from EU because they didn't want to be under that protection regime so i think that's probably the first thing but if you and realistically speaking if you look at the global market there's the eu block and there's the rest of the world so you have to decide for yourself where you want to go and where you want to write your code for but i understand where you're coming from um can i ask a question on that one right so the active approach everyone is like talking about hey, how do we regulate chat GPT and all these other things, right? It's difficult in that situation to for cost of business or to do business. Is there, do you see a movement for partnership or cooperation between the regulatory bodies to come up with something that is a little bit more uniform? For the EU, I can't see it happening. But having said that, they have got something similar to the tax and data and exception for copyright law. But it's about the only concession that I have seen, and that's only for copyright. But in terms of, you know, I, I'm afraid I can't. But the thing is, realistically speaking, though, we whilst whilst EU has this very stringent regulation, I think for all of us, for, for those of us in are in development of software and AI tools, you always you should always approach whatever you develop with um, ethics by design, privacy by design. To go by that, I think in the long run, maybe we can hope that EU might come and play ball with us. Otherwise, I think you have to do what is right. Don't be, um, obviously, don't be, over, you know, don't be manipulative and just ethical. And also be transparent. And, and that's all I say because as a lawyer, if it ever goes to court, you can show that what you've done is actually reasonably just meaning it's ethical and it's fair, it's very hard for the court to find fault with you. Um, and I think probably, I mean, maybe this, uh, this is the wrong audience for this, but I think there's got to be a lot more education for people to understand what is ChatGPT and these kinds of tools to so understand their limitations. Not to understand them to write a thesis on it, but understand, you know, understand the limitations and what they can and cannot do and not be too scientific uh, no, science fiction about the whole yeah okay last question um i just have a quick comment on your questions and i have a question for you um i think the world will have to adjust to the eu and not the way around when when dpr came out all hell broke loose and look what happened years have gone we've all adjusted so that's 
will happen eventually. I have a question um, for you on um, uh, AI regulations uh, as compared with uh, the use. I find them very, very similar, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, I try not to get into China if I possibly can because it's actually uh, it, it's too speed. It's too speed because they have very little for data protection, and because of that, even though they may have AI regulation, I don't know what that will be. So the government have might have one view, but the technologists and the tech companies and there's so many big tech companies there, they have a different view. And who in it? I don't know. But that's why I think it's a, it's a two-speed, I mean, a two-speed economy in a sense, in a very strange sense. So I don't really want to even look at the crystal ball to see what might happen in the end. But just comment on the GDPR and that the world will follow. I would disagree on that because the world actually hasn't followed. I mean, the world has followed in the sense that it has forced other countries to have data protection laws, but that's it. And so like Australia, where I come from, unfortunately, spent like the last 20, 30 years going between what you're going to do about data protection. Because on the one hand, it's got this Im immense loophole of a small business exception, meaning that if you're a business less than $3 million, you don't have to comply with any data protection. But it has data protection laws on the books because it tries to look as if it's complying with EU and trying to form some sort of safe harbor that doesn't exist. But on a whole of it, apart from having detection laws, I don't really think the rest of those fall to you at all. Uh, although, I mean, you know, in, in a book that I wrote, I did argue for it, but I've thrown my hands up and said I, I give up because I don't think it's going to ever happen. Uh, it's like cookies. Yeah, true, true, very true. Yeah, I mean, for some, some like cookies and websites which are transport, yeah, you don't have a choice. But if you're talking about medical devices and other AI tools, yeah, you can just simply say, well, I don't deploy it there. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Anna. Thank you. All right, that's a very exciting talk. And now we will uh, move to the second talk for today. Uh, the talk is about building ethical algorithm, the challenge for data and AI engineers. And this speaker is uh, Mr. Dominic Bigot, founder, CEO, CTO, Tech Research Service. Unfortunately, Dominic is unable to join us physically today. So what's going to happen is that we are going to play a recorded presentation by Dominic, and he will be joining us after this virtually. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank your CEO IQ APAC conference for giving me time to speak. Unfortunately, due to medical reasons, I'm unable to join you live at the conference today, but I will be joining by a phone patch uh, to answer any questions. My presentation today is called Building Ethical Algorithms. I thought that in recent months, with the rise of ChatGPT and generative AI, this topic could be discussed amongst data practitioners and non data practitioners alike. And I hope to be able to surface not just answers, but the key critical questions we need to be asking now that we're in this era of AI. I will divide my talk into four parts. I will start with a public health crisis, not the public health crisis you probably think, and then quickly segue into the post industrial revolution and the trends in technology. Then I will focus on the current era where AI has mainstream and look at how algorithms have figured in the recent years. And then I will close with a call to action on how we should be moving forward in this new age. So let's say a trip back in time. At the time when there was a public health crisis gripping the world, this was in the 19th century in 1894, when the world was in the grips of what's now known as the Great Manure Crisis. The Great Manure Crisis this was brought about by the rise of populations in cities and metropolises. And at that time, the major form of transport was horses. And where you have people, you have horses. And where you have horses, you have horse manure. And as cities got more populated, horse population also increased and manure population also increased. At the same time, in the same period, 
is the rise of phosphate mineral fertilizers. And for the longest time, manure was actually a material for fertilizers, but with the emergence of mineral based fertilizers, which was cheaper to store, not expensive to smell, and just easier to mass produce, the demand for manure fertilizers dropped dramatically, which also aggravated the manure problem. Well, as we know today, the crisis was a big deal that in 1898, the Urban Plan Conference was canceled because people were saying if anyone can cancel the manure crisis, there will no point to meet about urban planning. And all the experts, including sanitation and urban planning, even host experts, couldn't figure it out until the turn of the century where the automobile made a debut. So if you put yourself back in the turn of the century, people complaining about manure everywhere and start suggesting, what if the carriers move themselves and we didn't need horses to drive them? It was a radical idea, something closer to science fiction. That was in fact what happened. And we emerged of the car. In a few years, probably a little in a decade, horses went out of fashion and everyone shifted to automobiles. This transition between horses and automobiles also marked the transition between the first and the second industrial revolution. And I believe this is the key to understanding what's happening to society today. Because there are many lessons we can pick uh, out from the history of the industrial revolutions that will be useful today. According to the World Economic Forum, there have been no more than three industrial revolutions uh, since the end of the modern world. The first industrial revolution was steam and steam, which gave uh, rise to the colonial era with steamboats and railroads, uh, with the fast globalization of the world. Then the second industrial revolution was electricity, which brought with it a lot of the devices we know today, such as telephones, radio, car, air conditioning. And uh, this also led to the end of the colonial era, leading up to World War II. After the World Wars, the industrial revolution was the rise of electronics, which brought uh, the advanced gadgets we use today, such as the internet, cellular technology, mass production. And this is where we are transitioning from the third industrial revolution to the fourth industrial revolution. One thing of appreciating what the fourth industrial revolution is, is that up until the third industrial revolution, our relationships with machines was one way. We basically told the machines what to do, and the how good that interaction is, the machine would follow. But in the industrial revolution, a big shift happened. The machines can now learn to act on their own, independent of us. And the reason for that is data. So these are five characteristics uh, suggested by McKinney that this fourth industrial revolution. I'll start from right. The rise of big data. Everything generates a data point today, and there's an unprecedented level of data and computing power available to everyone today at low cost. And there's, since everything is now connected, it's now impossible to do anything in society without generating a data point, whether an interaction on your credit card or on social media, to post stuff online, to going to a video conference such as this, everything is data based. Data analytics is driving efficiency across business functions because you have a lot of data and it captures a lot of process. It's now theoretically possible to run your business completely electronically. And the most important part of the fourth industrial revolution is the area of what we call cyber physical technologies. So these are technologies that were either difficult to obtain, hard, and uh, impossible before, but they're now available now. And the reason we call cyber physical is that they allow the digital world and the real world to interact. Things like 3D printing, and of course, artificial intelligence. Now let's go to the present, 2023. What's happening now? In the last quarter of 2022, something interesting happened. OpenAI released ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is a long line of large language models that have been developed over the years. And this is also the emergence of image generation software, such as Stable Vision and Journey and Dali, and the rise of automation. Now, what makes this and AI different from the past? In the past, 
in a lot of highly skilled people to use and run AI models. While GPT and stable fusion make a big difference, the interfaces of the software do not require highly skilled labor, pretty much anyone can use it. And that's what's disrupting uh, the business world today. So let's draw a distinction between what was the popular AI up until recently and what's different about the current AI being used now. And the main difference is up until recently, the most popular AI models we use were the discriminative uh, variety. While the new AI become popular now is generative. So what's the key difference? A discriminative model is a model that takes an input and gives you uh, either a judgment or a calculation or a conclusion of it. So you might, for example, feed a photo to a discriminative AI and it's going to tell you whether that photo is a cat or not a cat or the probability of the photo being a cat. Well, in AI, it works slightly differently. It's kind of like you give a photo to a generative AI and give a cat and they give you more examples of cats. Or you could generative AI with the word cat and generative AI would give you cats. So one AI is not better than another, but these cases are definitely different. And what makes generative AI quite disruptive is, as I said, you don't need highly skilled programmers and scientists to use it. You still need scientists and programmers to develop it. But with AI being exposed to the public right now, you can actually prompt them using plain English. So examples of generative AI output include the generation of random samples and variations, uh, the generation of computational art, and uh, in the case of ChatGPT conversations with humans. So what is the implication of these tools? I think it's useful at this point to look back to some algorithms that have been used by the public and see how they fit. And this gives us a clue of what we need to be mindful of when dealing with generative AI. That's the least popular detection finding tool, arguably a simple AI that gives you the best actions given a certain map. And it's also updated by crowdsourcing, so the map changes in real time. What can go wrong with this process? Well, very recently, some soldiers using waves found a way to a Palestinian camp, and the curing altercation resulted in the deaths of some of the soldiers. And then, way back in 2015, a couple was vacationing in uh, Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, and was using waves to find their way to the dark. But owing to a typo or spelling error, waves inadvertently directed them instead to a slum where there was an ongoing gun war between two right gangs and uh, one, uh, one of the couple got shot and died. So the of wolves never imagined what we call edge cases. That's that actually, someone's going actually be in danger because of following directions based on uh, what's actually inadvertently uh, input data. Let's talk about social media. Every social media platform operates on similar principles. They're there to encourage engagement because the engagement leads to marketing. So, for example, we have a user named Sally, and she likes burritos. And because it gathered by the platform, it identifies Susan as similar to Sally. And because Susan has shared common characteristics, Susan recommended burritos because it's likely that Susan also likes the same things as Sally. On the other hand, it's another user named Sean, who also likes burritos. And because Sean is a common like, Sally also likes. Havayanas, and Havayanas is recommended to Sean. So these two relatively straightforward recommendation algorithms are what powers everything from the news from Google to YouTube recommended videos, the recommendations on eBay and Amazon. It's basically the principle that people tend to like things they've liked in the past and like things that other people say to them also like. And these are the recommendation engines. Very elegant marketing tool, as opposed to mass marketing, which is a waste of money because you're marketing to people that buy the product. Targeted advertising based on recommendation engines and high rate of return. So, how can this grow? Well, the proliferation of recommendation engines is incidentally also what's called tech chambers, which basically is the phenomenon that you only get exposed to information that you would like to get exposed to. And thereby depriving of the variety of content information you would have otherwise been exposed to. And this heightened the polarization 
and the proliferation of hate speech and misinformation online. At the same time, in the case of Myanmar, the uh, people were targeted by hate speech by the Myanmar military using Facebook's targeting algorithms. So it is possible to weaponize this kind of technology. And so not only the creators of social media envisaged that their platforms would be the venue of so much social injustice and hate. What about facial recognition, which is now uh, one of the one of the most uh, commonly used technologies in public or in public spaces. So this is what happened in the UK's facial recognition service for passports. Um, the left um, name he couldn't get a passport because all of them his eyes were closed. All right, a man who a bag could get a passport because the algorithm thought his mouth was open. And the uh, idea here is the traps were closed and their mouths weren't open. It might simply put have been the data that was used to train this facial recognition algorithm was biased against ethnic minorities. And it's the UK. So now we have cases where an algorithm can be systematically unjust or systematically flawed because of the data process that created it. And then finally, it's a big fix. So deep fix are uh, obviously a creative tool you can use it to generate new faces, swap together create different versions of pieces. Uh, the hands of the wrong parties and use for this information, what would happen? And then we're in the generative AI era. And those are all old technologies compared to generative AI. What's in generative AI? The first thing, large models are creating. They're creating highly probable pieces of text, virtually factual. And this has uh, to the right of uh, you know, people uh, claiming that research provided by language models is actually misleading or untrue. And you try asking uh, about yourself and some of a fictionalist biography you get. And the answer for this is quite straightforward. Languages don't retrieve information traditionally like a database, it's information dynamically, probabilistically, based on common found in existing language. And that doesn't really mean that the data is accurate as far as we understand it. It looks similar to other accurate data. These interactions are so unpredictable. This is a man of the suicide having a conversation with each other. Because the conversations were so it's possible that these conversations will trigger human emotions in ways that we don't understand. For image generation, tools copyright is a big deal. And this is an example of an ongoing suit to get images. Uh, so the stability and stable diffusion. The image on the right even contains a uh, kind of logo of getting images clearly inspired by an original image. But this image might actually pass most copyright uh, laws because it's not the exact same image, it's a derivative, which is a little bit area. So in my uh, network created these images, uh, satire basically multiple personalities like Bayan, Prince William, uh, New Putin, uh, running a street market in Manila and eating street food. This was clearly done uh, for demonstration purposes, but imagine if this was done for political purposes, what kind of misrepresentation would you do? In fact, uh, this information space is uh, now a problem area for generative AI. As you, as you can notice, the fingers on this policeman in this fake press release about the protests uh, in France. Uh, this book has six fingers, you know. So we need to be aware of what I call the fear of intuition. And one, one thing is to the deductive approach when coming up to knowledge. We start with theory and then try to back it up with facts. But the data science work in uh, a work opposite manner. We start with a lot of data first and fix any facts we can get from that data. And that can be efficient but dangerous because we need the first principle in place how we do data analysis. Many data scientists are actually trained from academia where uh, we're trying to prioritize significance, references, uh, publication, but business doesn't really care about that. Business is about profit, it cares about politics, it cares about the data. And this is a cultural change for most people entering uh, the commercial sector from academia. We have force math and machine, like in this article, Somebody's car into the railroad tracks following woods, and the first reaction was probably driver error. 
But the bottom line there is how can we consider technology in isolation of users? We need to think about users while we talk about technology. I've been talking about data assets since 2019, and I noticed far more people um, are fascinated by data science and data engineering, programming, those things like math, but that's largely left by the wayside. And we see this happening in recent after overs and Twitter and Google where the ethical uh, data things fired. And we need to be mindful of these issues. If the, the major term now is the alignment problem, uh, where a model can be accurate as far as metrics are concerned, but they do not reflect the intentions of the modeler. In fact, like in the case of uh, ChatGPT, GPT's only model, the statistical structure of language, does not necessarily mean it understands the higher level needs behind language. And just to make our lives more complicated, there's a lot of uh, confidence running around the aspects with the lack of competence. This is the Dunning Kruger uh, formula that's documented. There's a lot of hype around AI. So we need to be mindful of the noise that's being generated. I think one of the fundamental problems that's still plague the space is this issue of model drift. Basically, you train models technically on past data, which may not reflect future data. And this is a problem with uh, the phenomena that the models you already shifted model is now consistently being So when we conceive of data ethics, People are used to talking about privacy and security, and these are certainly important. But what we notice is that these issues like disinformation, ownership, liabilities, even data poverty and quality emerge after the privacy and security conversations are done. So privacy and security are not the only solution. We need to go beyond that and look at this of the data. At the same time, uh, when you look at the root cause of most algorithms, it's all the data, but the root cause of bad data and bad processes. And when we talk about fixing processes before we fix the data and the algorithms. So just about out of time, but I want to go back to where I started. There's a lot of learning you can get from the shift to automobiles. One of the biggest things for me is that it didn't matter how good you were with a horse. By the time everyone shifted to automobiles, your skin and the horse were pretty much useless. So we need to approach this new era with humility. It didn't matter what your skills were. At the time, you could be rendered completely useless in the era with AI. We have to be very, very deliberate at what these, these new technologies end up on Adelaide and stick to first principles. I'm just going to read the paragraph that came from a about the uh, because it's just so good. He said the most important problems we face cannot be simply optimizing the current system. It requires about technological innovation. Social problems are interwoven within the structure of the economy and habits of people. The solution to address and influence social patterns first. The solution to the money crisis did not come from force and capital experts or sanitation. It came from a completely different sector that kept the wheel of the carriage and changed everything else. So I talked about a public crisis, the manure crisis. I talked about the fourth industrial revolution. I talked about AI in the mainstream. And I talked about data ethics as a way forward. And I want to close with this. What distinguishes the fourth industrial revolution from its predecessors is the use of data and AI, which allow machines to act on their own. Machines from agency but without the moral code. And that's where we come in. It is our duty as engineers, scientists, and to ensure that we build ethical algorithms in the So will the ethical engineers, scientists, and analysts please stand up? So just a little about me, I run a portfolio of companies that focus on AI. Zero Ethics is my home organization. We do development uh, of AI use cases for companies. The S is a media company that it's works on ethical challenges with AI and data. And AES is a tech uh, company that focuses on data driven surveillance and risk management. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Uh, I'll be available for online QA. In the meantime, hope you can reach out to all of my social media accounts are posted here. In the meantime, thank you very much and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.
Hello, Nick. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Stopping is passing by. Can you hear me? Hello, Nick. How are you doing today? Um, good. Sorry, I can't join you guys on site, unfortunately. But uh, I hope uh, everyone right. enjoyed. We don't have uh, no mix audio at the moment. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. Can we up the volume a little bit? It's a bit soft for a minute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we are not saying. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, I can't join you guys on site, but I hope you enjoyed the talk. Okay, now uh, having Q&A, any questions from the floor? Okay, we don't have questions on the floor, but we do have a couple of questions uh, online, actually. Uh, uh, so the first question is this. Um, okay, you talk about the uh, industrial revolution, and you've also spoken uh, about uh, various societal implications, uh, for example, misinformation, as well as echo chamber. So uh, this particular question is asking about uh, what do you think in terms of generative AI? Do you think that it will further accelerate or worsen this issue? And uh, what do you think can be the possible solution? Okay, um, the audio here is very soft, so hopefully I caught the question. Um, I think there are three things we need to be mindful about uh, regarding generative AI. <clears throat> Number one is the fact that the access to these tools is pretty much open to the public. And this has been a very, this is a radical shift compared to the use of AI in the past where you basically had to be highly technical and had special tools uh, to use these uh, two uh, algorithms. Uh, Chat GPT is open to everyone. Stable diffusion is open to everyone. And this multiplies, I guess, the social impact of, of these tools. Um, will it accelerate the issues of old technology? I believe it will. The biggest problem I think most countries face is there isn't any direct regulation of AI per se. And regulation is a double-edged blade. Uh, I think I heard from the previous session. Um, you don't want to stifle innovation, and that's a big fear of most co uh, countries. But at the same time, you don't want these tools being used uh, for nefarious ends. And we saw that already happening with social media. Uh, it, <clears throat> Facebook continues to struggle with issues related to hate speech and censorship. Uh, and at the moment, no one seems to be able to come up with a kind of a holistic solution other than to ban it. Uh, in fact, Italy tried banning ChatGPT for a brief moment, and then they had to revert back simply because the opportunity loss is just simply too big to ignore if you ban these tools. Uh, even here in the Philippines, we, we have impending moves to start banning selectively uses of these tools. And again, banning is not the solution. The third impact is what we, what I, well, I, met, I failed to mention it in my presentation, but there's a lot of talk about what we call emergent properties. Uh, it's a bit of an abstract issue. Uh, the, the, the problem with the generative algorithms, as opposed to kind of traditional discriminative AI, is they learn from new information pretty much in real time. Unlike, you know, uh, if you have a classifier, you know, you want to classify a dog and a cat, you, have, you kind of have a fixed set of cat and dog photos and that data set doesn't change. While generative AI learns from the questions that you feed it. And that means uh, the directions that which a chatbot conversation can go can be totally unpredictable. Uh, well, but we've seen kind of earlier versions of this emergent phenomena when you look at, for example, uh, recommendation engines on YouTube, where if you just keep watching the recommended videos on the right, suddenly you're starting to watch really strange videos from where you started. And that's just owing to the algorithm that keeps recommending you 
new videos. And that's a very, very simple use case. In generative AI, the conversations can go in very many directions. And at the moment, as far as I can tell, there isn't a closed form solution to this uh, other than to just limit the, the questions that you ask. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever used this. Uh, there's there's a variant of ChatGPT called ChatPDF. I really like the tool. I learned about it just two days ago, where you basically just upload the PDF and then you can talk to your PDF. I feel that these are kind of side use cases that might be better in the long run because you can vet the information that the chatbot will interact with you on as opposed to kind of the broad chatbots, which just, you know, use pretty much any information. So, so I believe it will still continue to evolve, uh, but maybe that's the direction probably where, at least for commercial and industrial use cases, uh, can go rather than rely on a general purpose chatbot. You want specific purpose chatbots that improve productivity. But again, it's still early days. Thank you very much. Um, for the benefit of time, I'm going to pick one more question, Dominic. Um, I think this question is uh, related to one of your concluding slides, uh, where you mentioned about the deductive and inductive way of knowledge creation. Uh, okay, so the question basically is about certainly we understand that uh, AI creates knowledge in a different ways, perhaps we go this way, compared to artificial intelligence, and human probably is more natural to our belief. In your opinion, do you think that there will be a day whereby technology can help AI or in some other forms will advance so much that can fully duplicate the way human create knowledge? Well, honestly, it's a very hard question to answer. Uh, so maybe what I will maybe err on the side of is one thing these these tools are very good at doing that that humans are bad at doing is assimilating a huge amount of knowledge and then reprocessing it in many ways. For example, there was this application called AlphaFold, which was uh, created by Google DeepMind, which cracked protein folding. And simply because the machine is just capable of doing so many sample folding use cases beyond what was humanly possible. And then it generated new structures that would have taken humans 100 years to, to crack. I think that's one area where AI can certainly help us, like assimilating all the knowledge we have now and then figuring out new possible areas which we might have missed. But I'm not sure. In fact, I'm probably positive that AI will not be at the level where it can create completely new knowledge from scratch, or at least the way the AI work today. You still need humans to put in the creative input. But I think that's where the, the gray area also lies. You can have one creative input, like in the case of image generators, like a sentence, and then the AI will just create like a thousand images. So there's now a fine line where, where does the creativity really end? Does it end with a sentence or does it end with the actual generation of the image? And this is also at the core of the copyright problem that uh, Getty Images has. Uh, but, you know, learning from history, in, in the 19th century, photography wasn't considered art. You know, the society wouldn't accept a machine processing light would be the same as a painter with the brush. So I guess it's also a matter of perspective of where we want to put AI uh, in relation to ourselves. That's very true. I certainly agree. The evolving definition of concept, in fact. Okay, thank you so, so much, Dominic. And I look forward to seeing you in person in the future. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end uh, of this track. Thank you very much for being around. Um, I would like now to invite you to the foyer for a quick tea break. And up next is at 11.15 will be our panel and the closing session at the main auditorium. Thank you so, so much. And I hope that you have a lovely day ahead and I see you around. Thank you.